Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. This is part of a series of videos on Swiss cheese and wine. So last week, I covered the Swiss cheese Gruyere. This week, I'm going to cover Swiss wine. It'll be in two parts. Part one will cover history, geography, climate, and an overview of the wine growing areas. Part two will go into a deep dive into each of the six winemaking regions. These two videos will be at the level of what someone like me would be studying for the advanced sommelier exam or even the master sommelier exam. And very likely is going deeper than really anyone needs to know when looking at the syllabus. These are very much the kind of videos I expect to do if well, and when I ever work on my Psalm School Advanced channel. So winemaking has been happening in Switzerland since, well, at least the Roman era. The oldest evidence of just wine but not winemaking, comes from a 2nd century BC ceramic bottle found in a Celtic tomb in the current Valais Canton. In 58 BC, what was then called Haveltia becomes part of the Roman Empire and grapevines are then planted. Wherever Romans went, they brought grapevines in order to supply their troops with wine. It was part of their daily ration. Realize though that it takes a minimum of three to four years for vines to mature enough to make drinkable wine, at least by our standards. Now, after this, there isn't much about wine until the 6th century AD, when the King of Burgundy founds the Abbey of St. Maurice in 515. This abbey still has vines to this day. For the next several hundred years, we continue to have the church involved with the propagation of viticulture, well, like in Burgundy. Let's continue with some general history of the country. During this time, the area that is currently Switzerland is divided between the Kingdom of Burgundy and the Kingdom of Al Alemannia, a Germanic tribal confederation that also includes parts of modern-day Germany and Alsace. Some shuffling of territories and rule happened for a few more hundred years until the general area becomes unified under the Holy Roman Empire in 1000 AD. Fast forward to the 1200s, where we start seeing the beginnings of what would become Switzerland. By 1291, the first confederation of cantons is formed by three cantons, Uri, Schweiz, and Unterwalden, with the Federal Charter of 1291. Unterwalden is the present-day cantons of Obwalden and Niedwalden, or Obwalden or Niedwalden. Over the next four-ish hundred years, the territory would grow, wars would be fought, and the young country would effectively get its de facto independence from the Holy Roman Empire in 1499, with a victory in the Swabian War. Or maybe it's the Swabian War, I'm not really sure. However, it wasn't until 1648 under the Peace of Westphalia that other European countries recognized Switzerland's independence from the Holy Roman Empire. Things are going fine except for some internal strife with some civil and religious wars for another 150 years when the French decide to invade in 1798 fresh off for their own revolution. This rule is short-lived and they get kicked out in 1815. Now at this point we pretty much get Switzerland in its current form as a country. This also includes its official stance as being neutral. While they established a neutral stance in 1648, it wasn't until really 1815 that it was officially recognized by others. There were still some internal issues, but eventually the individual states realized that a confederation was advantageous and their constitution established this in 1848. The country is a collection of 26 cantons or states that are self-governing, but also have a central government. It's been compared to the U.S. and was actually modeled after the U.S. As a result, the cantons each have their own laws in addition to federal laws. Time for some geography. It goes without saying that Switzerland is an alpine country. 60% of the country is dominated by the Alps throughout the southern, eastern, and central part of the country. Now, moving west and northwest, we come to the Swiss Plateau or the Central Plateau. 
Farther west, the Jura Mountains form the boundary with France and southwest Germany. It's in the Swiss Plateau that most of the population resides. This also corresponds to where most agriculture, including viticulture, happens. Exceptions are in some river valleys in the Alps. The Alps are also the source of several major European rivers, including the Rhone, Rhine, Inn, and Ticino. Each have some various levels of importance in Switzerland, but also in France, Germany, Austria, and Italy. In addition to this, three lakes rank among the largest bodies of water in Europe. Lake Geneva or Lake Le Mans in French, Lake Constance or Bodensee in German, and Lake Maggiore. All three are influential when it comes to viticulture. Additionally, there is the Three Lakes region comprised of Lake Neuchâtel or Lac de Neuchâtel in French, Lake Biel or Bielersee in German, and Lake Merten or Mertensee in German. Just a side note, when you have the word sea, it's like our word for sea, except normally it just really means a lake, not like an ocean, at least as far as lakes are concerned. Plus, another 1,500 plus lakes are in the country. Now, when it comes to climate, Switzerland is a cool climate, if not really a cold climate region. However, the Swiss Plateau and the major river valleys are considered temperate. This is important for viticulture. This temperate climate is a direct result of the lakes and rivers moderating the climate around them. We have the intersection of four major European climates here. In the west is the North Atlantic Drift that is composed of mild and moist air masses. In the north is the North Arctic areas. Now that comprised, is comprised of dry and cold air masses. In the east, you have the continental areas that is going to be dry, colder air in winter and warmer air in the summer. And to the south, we have the Mediterranean, which is going to be relatively moist and warm air. Combined with it being dominated by the Alps, you have quite a large variation of temperature and precipitation. This also contributes to the two major winds, the Bizet and the Fon. While the main prevailing wind is from the west, the Bizet is a northwest wind that is funneled by the valleys of the Swiss Plateau towards Geneva and can be particularly violent. The phone is the one you'll probably hear more often. This is a warm, dry wind that comes down the mountain slopes. It usually lasts for a couple days. It's effectively the wind that is the result of a rain shadow. The winds coming off the Mediterranean are the main source for the phone wind. Uh, it hits the Alps and deposits all the moisture in the mountains as snow, then comes barreling down the other side. This action raises the temperature of the wind by as much as 25 degrees Fahrenheit or 14 degrees Celsius. While it's most associated with the winds coming from the Mediterranean, the source can come actually from anywhere. The name is generic in nature, but its source is from this area that includes Germany and Austria, which also use the same name for the wind. This same wind in Ticino in northwestern Italy is also called Favonio, and is from the winds coming from the north or west, usually in the wintertime. In other places in the world, it will be called something else, like the Zonda in Argentina or the Bergwind in South Africa. Depending on when these major winds occur, they can both negatively and positively affect the vineyards. In the spring, when you have flowering, it can literally blow off the flowers, which results in less fruit set. It can also cause damage to shoots and leaves with leaf damage, more likely in the summer. Later in the year, it can help with reducing fungus and other nasties. It can also thicken skins, resulting in higher tannins. In addition, it can impact the grapes by dehydrating them. So the timing of the harvest in the wind is a consideration. If we look at the Köppen Geiger climate classification map, we can see how it mirrors where the majority of vineyards are. The two classifications that are the most important are CFB or temperate, no dry season, warm summer. That's going to be in light green. The CFA is temperate, no dry season, hot summer. That's going to mean light yellow. Wherever there is light green, there's almost always vineyards. This is especially true in the Geneva, Vaud, and Valais cantons. This also includes what is known as the Three Lakes region that includes the cantons of Neuchâtel and Fribourg, along with the northern parts of Bern. This entire swath of light green is influenced by lakes and rivers. Ticino is in the southern tip of the country bordering Italy, and its climate in a few areas shows the hottest climates. These light green and light yellow areas are all along river valleys and lakes. The vineyards don't necessarily go all the way up the smaller river valleys, but they mostly mirror what you see. 
The rest of the green areas include the cantons of Jura, the rest of Bern, Basel-Stadt, Basel-Landschaft, Solothurn, Aragau, Zurich, Schweiz, Zug, Luzern, Turgau, St. Gallen, and a little bit of the largest canton, Graubünden. Almost all of these are from the German-speaking parts of Switzerland. Again, they mostly rely on bodies of water to help moderate the climate. The rest of the country in light blue that corresponds to the DFB classification, or cold, no dry season, warm summer, will have vineyards to a lesser extent. In these areas, you're more likely to have other forms of agriculture, especially dairy. Precipitation isn't a problem in the country. For about 75% of Switzerland, it averages over 40 inches or 1,000 millimeters per year. Much of that will be snow in the higher elevation areas, and the higher the elevation, the more precipitation that happens along with cooler temperatures. The Rhone Valley in Valais is particularly dry compared to the rest of the country. You'll see there are pockets of light green here too. The mountains block a lot of the precipitation to the valley, but the phone in, in conjunction with the Rhone River is also a factor in the overall climate. All right, time to return to wine and history in the 1300s. Now in 1313, we have mention of three native grapes, Reze, Yumanji, and Nerun in a deed. This happens again in 1419. Pinot Noir also enters the picture arriving via the French refugee Marie de Bourgogne. Continuing into the 1500s, the end of church control of vineyards happens. We then get the first written record of Chasselas in 1654. Sparkling wine becomes a thing in 1811 via the Bouvier brothers in Neuchâtel. The late 1800s brings the same things that affected the rest of Europe, various diseases and phylloxera, the latter causing half of the vineyards never being replanted. The 1900s sees modernization, the establishment of wine schools and research institutes, new grapes, the rise of organics and biodynamics, and Switzerland's appellation system. Into the 2000s, we have a continuation of innovation, modernizations, new grapes, and, well, new challenges. For the rest of this video, stats and information will mostly come from either the SwissWine.com website or the Federal Statistical Office. The Swiss Wine website probably has the 2019 or 2020 stats, and the FSO site has the 2021 stats. They really should just be pretty close, so I'm not concerned about mixing them. It's just a matter of convenience and how the stats are presented, and well, each source does it slightly differently, and really it's just when I was looking at the information, which one was on, on that particular site. Also, other information will come from other official Swiss government sites, along with any research on individual cantons' official websites. I use those in my research to confirm my information when necessary. There are six major wine regions. Depending on who's grouping them, they are as follows. Geneva, German-speaking Switzerland, Three Lakes, Ticino, Valais, and Vaud. Most of these are entire cantons, but the three lakes in German-speaking Switzerland encompass multiple cantons, with the latter having 18 alone. In total, there are 26 cantons with 77 wine AOPs. 20 of those are in German-speaking Switzerland. You may see some variations of the total number of AOPs, but rest assured I was thorough in my quest to count them. The one AOP that I included that I couldn't find on well, any list per se is the I de Pedrix AOP. It's called an AOP in a couple sources, but it's missing in others. I'll get to it in a little bit. The AOC slash AOP system is similar to the French system. Each of the 26 cantons is an AOP, though some produce minuscule amounts of wine. Each canton can also have subregions that are AOPs, though they are mostly in Valais and Vaud, with Fribourg and Neuchâtel also having at least one subregional AOP. In the German-speaking cantons, Bern is the only canton with more than one subregional AOP, and Zurich has one subregional AOP. All the others are just the canton, and as stated earlier, earlier vineyards in the, this part of Switzerland will be concentrated along lakes and rivers, especially lakes. Switzerland also has Premier and Grand Cru's. While specific vineyards or groups of vineyards will be specified, most of the time we only see a commune listed. It, in this case, it depends on each commune's regulations. Partially because of this, some Grand Cru and Premier Cru vineyards were impossible for me to find specifically. Some Premier Cru vineyards, I just use pins to indicate the general area for them. 
Also, some Premier Cru's are actually specific wineries, as far as I can tell. Regarding the Eye de Pudrix, it's a rosé style of wine from Pinot Noir. It's not on the Swiss wine website as an AOP. Even the list of AOPs that I found buried on their site and also on the Federal Office of Agriculture, which are the same list, uh, even though even they don't have it. Yet, when you do a search for it, you'll find it as an AOP. Plus, I found documents well, on the Federal Office of Agriculture, the FOA, that defines it as a, quote, controlled origin of designation, as well, Google translate it from the original German. Additionally, other Canton's official sites will have it listed. And while that document doesn't specify where it can be made, its original home is Neuchâtel. Now, funny enough, though, Neuchâtel's official site doesn't list any rosé wine. I'll get to the rest of that of the story later. There are a total of 14,696 hectares of vineyards in Switzerland and over 2,500 producers. Total production tops 100 million liters per year. The equivalent of over 11.1 .1 million cases or 133.3 million bottles of wine. With that said, much of the wine is consumed in Switzerland, with them only really exporting about 1% of their production. Switzerland is ranked fourth in wine consumption on a per capita basis at 33 liters. But they also import a lot of wine at almost a two to one ratio what they produce. They love Gamay, by the way, consuming more Beaujolais than the, than the US. Sounds like my kind of place. While there are over 250 cultivated grape varieties in the country, only 90 are listed by the Federal Statistical Office. The top four grapes that account for 66% of all grapes grown are Pinot Noir or Blau Burgunder for 26%, Chasselas, which is 24.4%, Merlot, which is 8.3%, and Gamay at 7.6%. Told you they love Gamay. The 2021 harvest shows an almost 50-50 split of red and white, with red accounting for 52% and white 48%. As far as within each category, Chasselas accounts for 55% of all white grapes, followed by Muller Turgau, also called Riesling Sylvaner, at 7%. Chardonnay is at 6%, and then the others uh, are the remaining 32%. For reds, Pinot Noir accounts for 47%, followed by Merlot at 15%, and Gamay at 14% and others the remaining 24%. Now, broken down by region, we have the following percentages under Vine. Valet is 32%, Vaud is 26%, German speaking is 18%, Geneva is 9%, Ticino is 8%, and the Three Lakes is 7%. While German speaking Switzerland does comprise 18%, that's spread out over, well, 18 cantons. You'll see websites saying it's 16 cantons, but that's incorrect it's also not considered as important as the other five regions. And that's where we're gonna stop for today's video. Next week, I'll go into much more detail for each wine growing area. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and then tell your friends, and we'll see you next time.